Well, good morning, everybody. I'm John McElroy with AutoLine. You may know me from some of the work that I've done with WWJ as well. We've got a tremendous panel this morning. You know, a lot of people, when they come in to do a program like this, say, oh, I'm so thrilled and honored to be able to do it. I gotta tell you, I am so thrilled and honored to do this. I'm truly looking forward to today's discussion. We're going to be talking about inequality in the workforce, what needs to be done specifically in the automotive industry. We're going to get you involved as well. We're going to be polling you for your uh, opinions on several things throughout this discussion. We also welcome your questions. We'll be checking the chat room too to get your input. Now to the program. We've got one whale of a panelist uh, lineup here today, including Carla Bailo, the CEO of the Center for Automotive Research in Ann Arbor. Terry Barkley is the CEO of Inforum. Cheryl Thompson is the founder for the Center for Automotive Diversity, Inclusion and Advancement, and Ashwini Bala Subramanian is the Director of Market Intelligence, Strategy, Sustainability for Martin Rea International. Carla, why don't I start off with you? Uh, we know that the auto industry has been struggling to improve workplace equality and inclusion and advancement. And I might've thought that the COVID pandemic with more people working from home, maybe that would have been a point of reset. But in fact, you all have looked into this issue and the data is not promising. I'm sure we'll get into all the details in the course of this conversation, but give us some of the highlights. What have you found of what's been going on since this COVID breakout? Well, John, you're exactly right. You know, what we thought you know, enabling more work from home has actually caused the reverse to happen. And the reverse to happen means that, you know, not only in industry, but in many other, in the automotive industry, but in many other segments, um, we're seeing women leaving the workforce for a number of reasons. But let me just start with some data because at CAR, we love data. So, you know, first of all, I want to look at just the last two bullets here. Everyone can read this. We'll, we'll send these out to all the attendees afterwards. But in 2019, so this is right before the pandemic, these are the facts. For every 100 men promoted to manager, only 85 women of all races were promoted. And within that number, only 58 African-American and 71 Latinas were promoted. These, these are the facts from McKinsey. And then the earnings disparity is even a, a worse tale of woe. And for every dollar that men earned, women on all, of all races averaged just 82 cents. And white women led the way there at 79 cents, but the other races are far short of that. 
So this, this is the facts even before COVID. So the next slide, you know, what are, what are some of the things that happened during COVID? Let's look at the second bullet. Between January and December, nearly 2.1 million women left the workforce. And at the end of December, the fourth bullet, all of the jobs lost were women's jobs. And this is, this is unbelievable uh, in, in my view. I was shocked to see this data come out. And then even more important, and what we're gonna focus on here today, it's really estimated that one in four women are considering leaving. That's 25% of our workforce, and that's today. Um, as, as we'll talk about later, Terry Barclay and I just recently um, are launching a book about what's happening with women during the COVID crisis. And I can't tell you how many times we heard repeatedly from women in executive positions, high earning women, that they're considering leaving. And it's really this mashup of conditions, but it's this merger of homeschooling, working from home, spouses being home all day, support system lack. Um, it's magnifying the stress that, that you would feel when you're in the workplace knowing that your children are either being at school or being well uh, taken care of. So it's just been compounded during COVID and that level of stress is untenable for many people. Jerry Barkley, let's get your input. I mean, you started in forum to, to fight this very thing. And you know, we'll get into some of the reasons why women wanna leave the workforce now because of COVID. But when you look at some of the data that Carla just presented in terms of earnings, in terms of promotions, what the heck is going on that this industry is going backwards? Well, <clears throat> you know, John, <laughs> you're right. Um, I've been personally, I've been at this 20 years and Inform has been at it for a while. But I want to not lose sight of the fact, you know, the, the phrase, don't waste a good crisis. We really have a once in a lifetime opportunity to reimagine the workforce and to really disrupt the way we've done things. And so shame on us if we don't take this opportunity to build you know, newer and better. And oh, by the way, have an opportunity to transform the image of this industry into one that is appealing and can attract the next generations of talent that we're gonna need if we're going to succeed. Um, but what we're seeing is that, that, you know, that combination of culture at companies um, co combined with our culture that still, even in this day and age, the majority of caregiving still falls to women. Now that's changing. And I know, I actually personally know, um, as I'm sure we all do, a lot of men who actually are taking the lead in that regard. But the data show that that overwhelming um, responsibility still is for, for children, for parents, um, it still falls on women. And so we are, have been in this pressure cooker environment that people are trying to find a way out. Yeah, Cheryl, let's get you in on the, the discussion here. You started the, the Center for Automotive Diversity, Inclusion, and Advancement. I, I think you pronounce it CADIA, the, the right. acronym for it, CADIA. Um, but what I like, you know, I was going over some of the material that you had sent to us in preparation for this discussion. What, what you're saying is it, it's not just enough to talk about it. And you've actually developed a process of what's going on here. Can you, you run us through that a little bit? Um, yes. Um, so Cadia, just uh, so everyone knows, if you Google it, it's an underground gold mine in Australia. So there is a gold mine in trying to address um, some of these issues that we have. And there's so much talent that has gone underutilized for so many years. And as Terry was saying, we've got a real opportunity with some of these things being exposed to, to address them. Um, so there's lots of great organizations working on this, but I think it is really requires a focus for top leaders to get involved, to be able to see things through a different lens that they haven't been able to see things through before. And I think a lot of the inequities that have been exposed from the pandemic overall and the recent events of spring and summer, you know, when we have the murder of George Floyd, we started having some of these courageous conversations 
so that leaders could start to see things that they hadn't been able to see before. So there's a real opportunity now to get some feedback from the employees to find out what are some solutions that are really going to work. And Ashwini, uh, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective here. I mean, you're actually working at a supplier company. Uh, what are some of the internal discussions that are going on at your company or are there going on? And what would you like to see the rest of the industry doing in terms of not just retaining women, but promoting them and paying them uh, accordingly with what men are doing? Yeah, there, there are a lot of good discussions and dialogue like Cheryl said that's coming out of you know this whole situation. Um, I honestly believe that what's good for women is good for parents overall, right? So I think this is a more holistic issue and it needs a system approach in order to solve it, right? So not one individual, one piece or one functional piece of the organization can resolve this. Because like we talked about in the prep call, the crisis with COVID is not just a humanitarian crisis, it's also a business crisis, right? So all the businesses are pretty um, severely affected in terms of you know performance, cash, preservation, and all of those other aspects that are important and critical to keep the businesses growing. So I always think it's important to assume positive intent. It's not that people are deliberately ignoring the women in the workforce. It's more that you know they're trying to keep their businesses afloat. So I think people that have a seat at the table, it's important for us to bring these issues to the notice of people that are decision makers so that they can bring this into their lens and their scope and their radar to look at it very holistically, right? So the caregiving issue um, is not just a, a mom issue, it's, it's a dad issue as well. So I think if we think about it as a holistic problem, I think a lot of different factors can come together in order to resolve it. Yeah, uh, great points there. So uh, Carla, I'm gonna come back to you, but everybody jump in anytime that you feel. So what needs to change? I mean, as Ashwini just pointed out, you've got to bring attention to top management of issues. What are some of the things that have got to be brought to their attention in terms of retaining women in the workforce? I mean, the, the numbers that you gave there, Carla, are enough to set your hair on fire. One out of four are considering leaving. So specifically, what's it going to take? More daycare uh, or what other kinds of things does the industry have to address? I, I think we have to think of a different playbook. I mean, we always look at the same things. We always say, maybe we need on-site daycare. Maybe we need grocery delivery service. These are all the things that, that we just pull out of our pocket. We're gonna try a new iteration. But I love Cheryl's preparation and document that she sent to us because it said, listen to your employees. I think that's the first thing. What's causing them the stress? Because if you don't know what's causing that stress, then you can't fix it. So, you know, one of the things that, that I particularly notice being home all day, and I don't have children at home. I met, my, I met my daughters now with three young children. I really feel stressed now. But you can never escape. And things that normally you can ignore while you're in the office, if your spouse calls, sometimes you can decline it. If, you know, your kids call, you can decline that too if you're in the middle of something. But if they're standing in front of you, or opening and closing the door, you can't ignore it. So even if we go back to what supposedly is better, this hybrid case, you can work when you want or work from home when you want, it's not gonna help that issue. So listen and understand what really needs to be part of the solution. Is it, you know, if their schools aren't open or if they're not comfortable sending their kids to school, is there a way to allow them to have a stipend for a private institution or something like that? Think about unique ways to manage it. And it's not gonna be a cookie cutter. Everybody's needs are different. You've got single parents now that are really going crazy. They get no break ever. And again, if they don't have a good support network, it, it's, it's really, really difficult. So how can we reinforce that support network? And what does that look like? Um, how can we enable that support network for a variety of sources? You know, some of the companies, and, and Terry can, can explain more about this from her network. Some of the companies, if you have a sick child, which in most companies say you have to stay home, that's it. You can't take them to daycare, you can't send them to school. There are some companies that allow you a number of days a year to have a, a private nurse come and stay. 
so that you can still work, even if you're home, you can still work and tend to that sick child, but you have somebody qualified to take care. There's a number of things like this that we can think about um, for the future. The other is you need to make sure that people aren't feeling isolated. And this is one of the big things we've seen in COVID is this isolation aspect, this lack of camaraderie, being on all the time. We never get a break. If it's eight o'clock at night, we get a call, we feel we have to take it. We get a text, we have to take it. We get a mail, we have to check. How can we make sure we firmly establish on off and respect that for everybody? So these are just my ideas, but first you gotta understand what the problems are you're trying to solve and don't think of the same old menu. And, and Carla, if I could, you make such a good point. And I think that's one of the major takeaways that I'm hearing is the point you made about asking your employees, listen, ask them, don't assume that your definition of what constitutes flexibility is the same as what your employees think makes for flexibility. So ask them. The other, th the other point that I would make, and it again builds on, on Carr's relentless focus on data, right? Um, and you know, John, I, I've just seen this having been at this for a couple decades. Macro, macro level data is not actionable unless companies have a deep understanding of their own workforce analytics. Um, it's because macro level data may not be the same as your data. But if I think that it's very important for CEOs and C-suite leaders to commit to sort of a relentless focus on drilling down to on their own data analytics so that you have a data, to, to Carla's point, you have a data-driven solution. I, I love that. And, you know, this whole idea of asking people what they need, you know, I don't know if it's the automotive industry or if it's leaders in general, we've kind of shied away from really getting personal with our employees, right? We, we don't often know how many kids they have or what their personal situation is. So I think it's um, developing leaders to be more empathetic, to check in, to ask people how they're doing, to, to understand what is their personal situation, and then to address that sense of isolation that people may be feeling. And then absolutely, we need the data. Like, why are people leaving? Where did they go? Like, keeping in contact with those who have left um, to understand what are some of those reasons. So I think that that personal understanding is really going to help us develop some unique, flexible solutions. And I saw in the comments about, you know, being a mother issue. I think we need to de-gender, de-parent, and de-stigmatize some of these flexible solutions that we've been talking about for a really long time because it has been seen as a women's issue. I think Gen Z is going to just kind of change things. We see more men involved and people who want flexibility for different reasons. It doesn't have to be a caregiving situation. So I think the question is, how, oh, sorry, Ash Ashwini. No, go ahead, Carla. So maybe you can answer this question better then. So, so, you know, the question for me becomes, how can we destigmatize that in, in industry? How can we, you know, if, if, a, if a man takes Family Medical Leave Act, how can we get rid of that? Gosh, what a wuss, you know, we can tell who wears the pants in that family. You know, how can we change that narrative? What needs to happen to make that uh, a feasible feasible I, I, way of thinking. I, I want to build on that, Carla. So two things. One, I think um, that when when we're talking about, you know, these policies, flex work policies that companies are trying to adopt, right? So say they're saying, okay, be in the office 50% of the time. It's very hard from an organization's perspective to have a policy that can be customized for each individual needs, right? So they have to have a blanket policy that they think will work for most of the workforce. But I think as leaders, as individual people within the leadership team, it's important to have that dialogue with each of your team members. And I think in order to get honest feedback, it's important to humanize yourself first, right? So we have this tendency of separating our professional and our personal lives and we feel like we can't talk about being a mom or being a dad or, you know, going to the soccer match for your 
children in the evening and you have to keep it all separate. So what I have found is effective is you open up yourself first, right? And you talk about um, your own personal, uh, I'm not saying bring all your personal issues to the workforce, but, you know, kind of make it normal, normalize it, right? Normalize having these conversations. And we've, we've had, we all are in Zoom calls all the time. And we have team members whose kids, you know, need attention. We say, okay, yeah, bring them on their lap. We can keep going with it. So you have to kind of normalize this whole situation then making people feel like they're asking for special permission, right? They're asking for a special concession from their employees. So I think it's important to have that dialogue on a one-on-one -on -one basis because it's impossible for the organization to have a blanket policy that works for everybody, right? Hey, th this might be a good time right now. Let's hear from the audience. Let let's get some of their input on what's going on here. Let's bring up the first poll question, which is, how have you seen the COVID-19 pandemic impact the women within your own organization? If you and the audience would take a look at that, we'd love to get your input on it. We'll get to the results in just a, a few minutes here. And uh, well, let's keep uh, the conversation going on uh, what we've got going here. Uh, what about this idea of a hybrid office? Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, uh, of it. And Terry, I see you nodding your head. Why don't you pick it up from there? You know, is is has its time come? Yeah. <laughs> well, I absolutely think its time has come. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing more and more big companies um, going, announcing that they're going in that direction on a long-term basis. Um, and there's lots of data to show that it it's, it's a positive thing that attracts employees. I think we're only at the beginning of seeing the research about are there differential impacts from work from home uh, policies? Because if your culture does not catch up to your policy, we know that, that there's gonna be differential impacts from those policies. There will be the in-group that goes into the office and benefits from, the fa from FaceTime um, and who's included in all those informal meetings to make decisions. So uh, we know that that's just not, that's a human tendency, right? It's a, it's a human tendency. So I'm, I, I'm hoping, and now mind you, I don't think any industry has this figured out <laughs> and lots of places are trying thing, things, but to Carla's earlier point, we do have some interesting examples from other companies about, um, how they're trying things to try to equal out, you know, make sure that there's no um, differential impact. For example, in a hybrid office, um, leaders still need to conduct their meetings virtually from their offices so that everyone is participating on equal footing. There's not a group of people in the room and a group of people who aren't in the room. We've heard so many positive things from global companies where finally that big divide between headquarters and the hinterlands has been, has been there's been some equalizing because everybody's <laughs> virtual. So we need to be sensitive to to that equalization when uh, equal opportunity when we go to hybrid offices. And I have more examples, but let's let's see what our poll questions were. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, few to none have left, but some women have been experiencing disengagement and stress, which is exactly what we've been talking about. And uh, Ashwini, let's let's continue with this idea of the hybrid office, where you work maybe at home most of the time, in the office part of the time, or vice versa. Is this something that you're considering at uh, Martin Rea? Yeah, yeah, we already are in that kind of work mode, right? Um, we do have um, a rotational policy in place, um, but I think what we haven't assessed, just like Terry said, it's all new. It's very much in its infancy. I think the industry and the rest of the world has an assessed, does this cause any issues in terms of innovation and collaboration um, taking a backseat sometimes? Is it really as effective as having people, you know, sit together, brainstorm together, come up with innovative ideas? So that 
piece is not very clear yet. There's not a lot of data out there, and I think we'll continue to see that. But in anticipation for that, taking a backseat, maybe we need to start considering how do we make sure when we have these kinds of discussions, we're inclusive, we're making sure everybody gets a chance to voice their opinion. Everybody's voice is heard, right? So you have to purposefully as a leader make sure that not just the people in the room are interacting, but people that are remote, you have to almost call them out to be able to get them to get their voice in, right? Because if you're an introvert or if you are not in the room, it's hard to guess the temperature of the room or you know the right timing to interject and talk. So it almost falls on the person hosting or the person leading the meeting to kind of call for those people to be included. Otherwise, I think the people that are remote are not going to be able to get their voice heard um, in a fair manner. That's at least my observation. I, we're yeah. getting some really good stuff here. You know, uh, make sure everything's being done virtual. Everyone's on a, a level playing field and the like. Carla, you pick it up from there. Yeah, I, I just, as I'm listening to this, you know, the water cooler conversation is going to happen. And it's all about communication and I want to call it citizenship. If a team is a team, you don't go out on the field and say, oh, we're missing the second baseman. We can play anyway. Let's go. You don't do that. So at the water cooler or whatever the conversation is, if one of the team members isn't there, somebody needs to stand up and say, you know what, we need to include so-and-so, whoever is not physically there. And it's gonna take us an extra five minutes. I'll text them, we'll get them on a virtual call, but somebody has to step up to the plate. I love sports, so I'm gonna keep these acronyms going. Um, and, and you know, not allow that game to start unless you have all the players at the table. But it's going to require somebody to do that. And it's going to have to be this inner voice. And maybe it's training. Maybe it's talking about company culture. Maybe it's a communication dogma that you create. But somebody has to be there and be in charge and say, we are not going to talk about this and make this decision unless we consult or bring into the discussion the right team players. You know, and I think that we've been at this for a year. <laughs> so there's been a lot of lessons learned that I think that we can build on. And I'm really hopeful that we don't have amnesia. And when we do start going back to work, whether it's hybrid or, or um, more percentage of people are back in the office and we still have people at home, that we don't forget everything. And, when, and that we, we can maybe build on some best practices um, of being inclusive, like um, Terry and Ishwini were talking about pulling people in. And I love the sports analogy, Carla, it was perfect. And giving trust and empowerment to our leaders. The, the people who are on the front lines every day leading others need to be empowered and need to trust their people. I think that's something that's been missing for a while. And I think about, you know, when we're trying to figure out these complicated policies, Think about the dress code policy that Mary Barra simplified with two words, right? Mm -hmm. Dress appropriately. It's, we, we have to apply the same rules here, understanding what works for individuals and using common sense and empowering our leaders. Carol, how do you make sure that the industry doesn't slide back? You know, we have been interrupted for a year. I mean, it's been a huge yeah. interruption. Great opportunity here. Like Terry says, don't waste, uh, you know, uh, this kind of opportunity, this, this crisis. But how do you how do you instill or change culture so that it doesn't snap back to the way it was before? Yeah, I think we've got to have those really honest conversations with the C-suite. The CEO and the C-suite have to be at the table for these discussions and talk about um, what are our values, who do we want to be going forward, and we've got to keep coming back to that. And then coming back to the data, you know, are we losing people? Are we seeing attrition of women and other diverse talent at numbers out of, you know, out of alignment with the majority? So continuing that conversation. And I think now is really the time to double down on culture. You know, I think, John, uh, oh, go ahead, Ashwini. No, no, I was just gonna build on what um, Cheryl was saying. So I think honestly, be, because of what we've gone through this whole year, I think that the workforce, either the workforce that's en entering you know, the industry right now or the people that have gotten used to the hybrid work environment, I think companies will have to think about creative ways to 
engage and, and you know attract talent because it's going to become a business imperative. And if you don't have a policy or a way to creatively engage people, it's going to become a disadvantage in terms of attracting new talent to your organization, right? Because every organization has a certain amount of turnover, so you're going to look for new talent all the time. So if you don't have that kind of mindset, it's going to become an adva- disadvantage for you in the in the industry, I think. You know, Ashwini, the point you just made is a great segue to, you know, John, what, what I think we need to get better at in order to make sure that these lessons stick, are sticky, um, is we need to get better at being clear um, or making tangible the benefits of gender inclusivity, how that is impacting the performance of organizations positively, how flexible work arrangements are, like Ashwini talked about, it would become a talent attraction. We always talk, my frustration is, we always talk about those things in sort of abstract, fuzzy ways. You know, what if we had some really clear metrics (laughs) That, you know, and and over the year, we've seen research um, efforts, for example, EY and the Peterson Institute did did some research that said that uh, organizations with gender diversity in their leadership were six, six percent more profitable. You know, what if we could tie some positive metrics to these behaviors that we looked at um, as ways of keeping that North Star of uh, in focus for culture change. I stumbled over how I said that, but maybe others have other ideas. <laughs> I just want to build on that and then I'll turn it back to, to John to expound probably more on what you were just talking about, Terry. But the conversation needs to be in every succession planning meeting that's held. And in a lot of those over the years, as you look at the succession, especially in certain departments, and Cheryl has a lot of data about this, like manufacturing and others, you go out five or 10 years and you don't see a diverse candidate coming through the ranks. It's not there. And we often hear they're self-selecting. Well, if they're self-selecting, it's because there's some exclusivity happening, some sort of club that exists. So unless we bring this element into every stage of succession planning all the way down to each person's personal development plan for the year in their yearly evaluation, we won't see this change happen. And that's regardless pandemic or not, seeing more um, diverse candidates moving up in the organization. We need to get that into their the working plans, make sure we have the training enabling ways that they can continue to improve. And in every succession planning meeting, if you don't have somebody saying, wait a minute, this isn't the metric that we want to be at, you're never going to get where you need to be. So you need to make sure you have that open dialogue and communication and you need to take a harsh look at yourself if indeed comments are being made that don't fit where your diversity goals um, lie. Because if you don't, shareholders are going to, and this is going back to Terry's comment, shareholders are taking notice. And there are companies that are saying, I'm not gonna invest in you unless you have X amount of diversity in your board. And you can guess they're gonna start looking more stringently at the other metrics. It's coming and it's gonna hit your bottom line. Yeah, Cheryl, this is teed up perfectly for you because while we've been focusing on women and what's going on because of the COVID pandemic, It applies to minorities. It applies to people with different sexual preferences and things like that. How do you build the pipeline to make sure that you've got this inclusion? Right, right. Well, I think we've got to go at it from a number of different levels. So, you know, thinking about talent specifically, um, I think we need to provide all kinds of professional development, mentoring, sponsorship, all, all of that, working on some of the mindset things. Um, often it's difficult to see yourself as a leader if you don't see anyone who looks like you. So really helping people overcome that. So that's why it's so important to have diversity at the board level, at the C-suite level, so that we can attract that talent and they can see um, a path forward. Um, Second is systems. You know, thinking about how do we retool our talent systems 
so that we can minimize bias. We, we all have bias, it's never gonna go away, but being aware of that bias and learning how to minimize it. And then what are some of the updates that need to be made in our policies and procedures so that we de-gender, de-stigmatize, and de-parent um, some of these flexible work policies. And then leadership commitment. That, that commitment has to come from the top. The tone is set from the top. And um, I, so I think those are the three things. Um, I like to look at those as a three-legged stool. And then the seat of that stool is culture, right? OK, so broad question to everybody. And then we'll get to our next poll question. How do you, it, Cheryl, it's great. If you've got a visionary CEO who says, hey, this is the way we've got to go, great. You can't count on that. How do you put the pressure on? Terry raised a really good point. Let's get metrics out there. Let's show what's, uh, what's positive about doing things the right way. Uh, I, I think, Carla, you just mentioned shareholders. We're seeing uh, corporations getting dragged into political fights like right now, like we've never seen them before. But how do you make sure that pressure is there? Who wants to take a first stab at it? Well, I can, well, go I, ahead, Terry. I, I can tell you that the shareholder pressure is without question something that I see leaders sit up and take note of. Um, we've had great progress um, nationally. We still have further to go. But we've seen the effect of shareholder pressure to get more women on, on boards. And so that's a start. It, it you know, <laughs> quarterly earnings, that's a start. <laughs> and I think it also rolls into um, being able to hire. Um, young people today care about the ethics of the company. They care about the diversity. They care about the face of the company and the, even the products that that company makes and how sustainable they are. You're going to have, you're going to start to have a hard time hiring if you don't do this. And then the other one that makes everybody cringe is let's put the metrics in everyone's performance, uh, you know, supplemental income plan. It makes everybody's hair stand on end. Oh my gosh, I don't want that metric. But we all know what gets measured gets done. So maybe it's time to reopen that that door, especially when we're seeing the stagnant that we're stagnant figures that we're seeing in our industry. You know, there's an old adage: "Show me how you're going to measure me. I'll show you how I'm going to perform," which ties in right with that. But Ashwini, let's get you in in on this. What, what... I, I think, in addition to the metrics, one thing that's I think very unique about the auto industry is we have a mix of people that work in corporate locations and we have people that work in plants. Right, manufacturing plants. I think the challenge is even more profound when you're working in a plant environment and we can't forget that piece of it. Because like I said before, we have to approach it holistically because if we can figure out how to bring flexibility and adaptive culture in the plant, I think the corporate piece will be much more easier to um, move forward with, right? So I think that piece of it will be critical because sometimes I think the, the organizations struggle with, am I treating the plant employees the same as the corporate? Or is one getting more advantage than the other, right? So we, we, we have to kind of balance both pieces of it when it comes to the auto industry. And we can't forget the people that are working in the plant environment, I think. Wow, what a great point. You know, you can't work from home if you've got to be on the assembly line. <laughs> you've got to be there. So uh, maybe we can explore this a little bit more in the conversation, but I think this is a good time to do the second poll. So let's bring that up and get the audience reaction to this. And the question was, if it were up to you, what would be the ideal hybrid work environment? In person, mostly in person, 50-50, mostly remote, 100% remote. Uh, go ahead, audience, give us your input and uh, we'll get to the results of this in just a moment. But let's keep the conversation going. Ashwini, I, I love your point. Let's come back to that. How the heck do you make it fair for the people who work in the plants to have this kind of flexibility? Any ideas of how to do that? Well, I think, well, go, go ahead, Ashwini. Yeah. No, 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 I think the awareness of the need to include the plants, the hourly workers is, is, a, is a great start. Um, they have not traditionally been included in some of these diversity, equity and inclusion policies. In fact, Volvo, um, who just announced their, what is it, 24 or 26 weeks paid leave over a three year period of time, that includes hourly workers. 
some of the other policies have not included hourly workers. In our work, we're seeing that's in, in addition to metrics, Carla, <laughs> the number two issue that everybody wants to talk about because it's a challenge is how do you include the plants? And so when we start looking at other industries, it's very similar. How do we include the hourly workers? Like looking at retail as an example, right? Productivity is measured relentlessly. <laughs> Face time is required. So I just, I think it's one of those conversations that we need to include the hourly people, the people in the plants in to be able to come up with some effective solutions. And I think, like I said before, Jan, there's, there's no one blanket solution for everything, right? So I think it's important to understand how are the needs of the people that work in the plants different than the people that work in corporate offices, right? So I think it's important to talk to those people, understand what their needs are, what their challenges are. Because like you said, you, you've got to show up to the plan because you're building parts, you can't do it remotely. Does that mean the organization needs to creatively think about or the leaders need to creatively think about, do we provide them with additional, you know, allowance for, you know, supporting their family? Like what the panel was talking about here before is do we provide them ways to find qualified, you know, caregivers um, so they can take care of their kids or their family as needed. So I think we need to first understand what their needs are, what their challenges are, what are they feeling, right? Without assuming that what we think at the corporate level is the challenge that they're facing as well. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in the plants, as you all know, you have scheduled absenteeism. You have uh, an issue that you got to deal with. You, you go to your supervisor or whomever. And you, you say, hey, next Tuesday or whatever, it is, you can plan ahead. You know, with a pregnancy, you can really plan ahead. So I would think that there is opportunities for flexibility. It's going to be fascinating to see how Volvo handles that. I, I think, you know, they're, they're really the pioneers. <laughs> Carla, you're really nodding your head. Pick it up from there. Yeah, I, I, I really want to see this happen. And I'm, I'm a big advocate of if you can't, solve a problem, get a bunch of five-year-olds in the room and they'll think it up for you because you don't have these preconceived notions, you know, of what you can and can't do. And I really liked what, you know, was said about other industries where FaceTime is so important. You know, we have to think about different ways to deal with it. There are many companies in Michigan these days that started the mommy shift during COVID because, you know, they had to deal with, with school and learning. I hate that name, the mommy shift, because I'm certain men took advantage of it too. But nonetheless, they started it out of necessity. But why not take that the next step and think about job sharing on the line? Think about how you can support a 6 a.m. start because daycare doesn't open at 6 a.m. How can you maybe allow somebody to hire an au pair that can come and stay with them? That's expensive, but maybe it's the only solution that allows them to work it out. You know, and it's, it's kind of this menu of a la carte solutions, but you need to think differently. And that old mentality that if you're not here by 5.30, you're late has to, has to dissipate. And we have to be cognizant that everybody has an important role to play in, in creating this product that we're, we're producing in this plant. Everybody has a role. We need them all here. And we need to think about how, how best to make that happen because that's the kind of company that we are. Carla, you're giving me flashbacks to when I worked at Wix of Assembly Plan. If I wasn't on the line by 5 a.m., I was late. Yep. <laughs> so, you know true. so true. So true. Um, you know, I, I, I think about uh, the medical field, like doctors and nurses, they're dealing with human lives. That was the thing that whenever I had an issue, um, uh, you know, in the plants where we had a line down, we're trying to fix something and I would get really stressed out. The way I would ground myself is say, these are powertrains, these are transmissions, these are not human lives. So I look at the medical field, they're dealing with human lives and they've been able to come up with some really creative solutions for flexibility for nurses, even doctors are coming up with solutions. So I agree with what my fellow panelists are saying. We need to talk to the people, get their feedback, see, see what works. In Cheryl, order can to you give us some of these policies? Mm -hmm. Can you give us any examples of what the medical community has done? Well, the, the nurses have the, you know, three days a week where they work 12 hours and then they have the rest of the time off. There's job sharing. 
doctors now are joining these groups um, where they're having these flexible um, arrangements as well. They can work as many or as little hours as possible. They have con concierge services um, to attend to some of their personal needs. So a whole host of solutions. You know, in the plants, we've always had tag relief. There's mass relief where everybody takes mm -hmm. a break at the same time. There's tag relief. You, somebody tags you on the shoulder, you go take a break and they take your place. Maybe there's something along those lines that we could be doing as an industry. Hey, uh, do we have the results of the poll? Let's bring that up if we do, and we do. And uh, very interesting. Uh, wow. wow, people <laughs> expect to be staying home most of the time or you know, a 50-50 mix, not 100% in person. Look at that, 0% <laughs> want 100% in person. Very, very interesting. If that's not going to change the conversation in some companies, I don't know what will. Boy, nobody a, 100%. Very interesting. Um, let, let's go back, since people want to work in the, the virtual world, or at least part of the time, Terry, how, you know, I, I think you brought it up earlier, you know, where there's the group that is at the office or there's that meeting at the hall in the hallway, spontaneous or at, at the coffee maker. How do you do that virtually or can you do that virtually? Oh, I, I absolutely think that you can do that virtually, but it requires, it's going to require a commitment uh, to do things a little differently. Um, and to try to try some new things. I think it's really, what I'm concerned about is I think it's tempting to assume that work from home is, will be a great equalizer for, for women, um, but seemingly objective systems can um, pro produce unequal outcomes if you don't think them through really, really carefully. So care and attention needs to be put. And I'm seeing companies trying things like the, if you're in the office, you still do meetings virtually, even you know, so that you're you're leveling that that playing field. Um, you know, there's um, lots of opportunity for us to innovate around that, but it has to be intentional. You know, one of the things we talked about, another a uh, couple of examples. Um, there are companies who've put. Uh, policies in place to help with parental leave. And Accenture recently, for example, uh, and this doesn't relate specifically to the virtual work environment, but it's how you try to, to what is your phrase, de-gender and de -stigmatize, de parent. Cheryl. <laughs> yes. You know, um, Accenture just imposed a new rule. When you think about that company, that's a company where you get on a plane every Monday morning and you come back Thursday night, right? And they put in a rule that um, there's there's more or less a travel ban or travel hiatus for one year within um, uh, uh, either giving birth or adopting a child. And they enforce that or they apply that equally to men and women so uh, who who have a child coming into the family so that it's an effort to say this policy applies to everyone not just um, so that it's not a matter of who raises their hands i think we're going to have to see more experiments like that uh, in the work from home environment where you are paying attention to how things are being utilized. I've, I've, I've also, I also have one other really cool um, story to share. And this is from an employer who was dealing with the isolation that can come and the lack of networks that can come from the, the remote environment. And that is um, they set, they schedule time where people are online through whatever platform they're using, but they're not in a meeting. They're just working at their desks as if they were working next to each other in cubes or at a table so that every once in a while you pop up like you would make a comment to your, your office mate every once in a while, gee, you know, <laughs> a comment on that. But it's just, it was kind of parallel processing and it was a deliberate attempt to provide an opportunity for that casual chit chat and casual connection that wasn't a scheduled meeting. 
Um, and it sounds, when I first heard about it, I thought that sounds kind of weird, but then I thought, wow. And they are having fabulous results from that. And that was a suggestion back to everyone's points about listening to what your employees are saying to you. That was a suggestion that came from a younger single person who was isolated at home and missing the water cooler chat. So uh, lots of innovative solutions, I think. That's a great example. I'd never heard, yeah, what, what else, Cheryl? I was just thinking about, um, you know, what Terry was saying about um, some of the opportunities for leave. And I just wanna be careful uh, uh, and make sure that we're thinking about the unintended consequences. So when somebody goes out on leave, um, there's the chance that they're going to come back to a lesser role or maybe a part-time role, even have like a gap in their resume or a stop in their pay. And I was thinking about this idea of compounding. Have you ever heard of um, that old adage, do you want a million dollars in 30 days or would you take a penny doubled every day for the, for the next 30 days, right? So at, at day one, obviously it's one penny. At day 20, it's $5,000. At day 27, it's $671,000. At day 30, it's $5.3 million. So thinking about that uh, idea of compounding, what are women going to lose um, if they do take leave? So just being really intentional, as everybody's been saying, about what are the, what are the effects and then using data to be able to react. And then to Terry's point about experimenting, um, right? We, don't be afraid to try something. We've got to try things and see what works. Cheryl, to your point, there actually was a study and I, I'm not able to pull up where it's from, but they found that flexible policies, it, to your point about unintended consequences, flexible policies help retain women, but at lower levels, it doesn't help them rise. And so again, unintended consequence, not the point of the policy, but we need to pay attention. Yeah, and I think that gap in your resume doesn't mean you got less capable. In fact, you probably gained other skills that will help you become a better employee, better manager, because you weren't just you weren't just sitting around. You were you were doing something. And we see that gap in the resume as oh, that's a warning sign. And that's exactly the wrong reaction. It should be you should be asking the questions when you're talking to that person seeking to come back in the workplace. You know, what did you learn? What, 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 what skills did you acquire that you didn't even know you had before? Um, how does that benefit us now if they're returning back to the company? Um, I, I personally took a two year gap in my career um, and it was an opportunity to, to be a trailing spouse and uh, go to Europe and we weren't gonna turn that down. And when I came back, I, and I, I was talking with the company I had left, I said, certainly I haven't, I haven't lost my skills just because I was gone two years. And um, in fact, I did this and did that. I led the religious ed program, blah, 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 blah. I did all these other things. Um, so I expect to come back at the same level as when I left. And I did. I was able to come back at the same level and then continue the trajectory. But you have to negotiate that. And you have to stand up for yourself, be you male or female. Um, if you do have a gap in your resume and talk about what you learned and what you did and how you haven't lost a beat and in fact have become better and a more well-rounded person. Hey, we, we've got to squeeze in one more poll question to get the audience's uh, reaction to what we're all talking about. Let's bring that uh, final poll question up. And what do you see as the biggest issue regarding the hybrid work environment? Loss of FaceTime, communication issues, risk of implicit biases, balancing work. Uh, so go ahead, audience, fill out that poll or, or give us your opinion of how you think things are going to go. And uh, Ashwini, let's start with you keeping it working now. What do you think is really working now? What, what, what's going right? And how do we put more muscle behind that and make it continue? I, I think the flexible work situation is actually great because a lot of companies that were hesitating, I think COVID forced them to accelerate adoption because they just didn't have a choice. But I think we have to kind of think about remote work a little differently. So all of the organizations, especially in automotive, we've become global, right? We've been global almost for two decades now. 
So everybody on the leadership team is used to handling people across the globe, across the world, right? You have direct reports working in China, you have direct reports working in India and Europe. So I think there is some amount of stigma attached when you say someone's working from home, right? To me, in my mind, it's no different than having someone working in Germany or in China, right? So I think it's a little bit of retraining of our mindset of how we view someone that's working remotely from home. Maybe we need to take, you know, like Cheryl was saying, maybe we need to take away some of that um, verbiage out and we just call it remote work instead of saying work from home, right? Because I think we know how to handle global teams. It's not new to the auto industry. We've, we've learned how to do that and be global. We just need to kind of retrain our mindset and say, okay, some of the local people are going to be remote as well. So we just need to bring the same leadership practices we've employed in order to keep our global teams intact and you know engaged to the people that are working remote as well. I think it's there. We just need to tap it and in, tap into it and think differently about remote working for the teams that are already in in the corporate office or in our local location. Yeah, Cheryl, any ideas uh, or input on what's working and how do we keep that going? Yeah, I would say what's working now is an increased awareness of inequity. Um, it, it has been highlighted throughout the whole pandemic when we think about access to care, um, access to good internet, um, and then of course the events of spring and summer with George Floyd and, and others, there's a, a lot greater awareness of inequities. And, and that's what we're talking about here uh, specifically for women. So I think um, uh, the, the discussion we were having about boards and financial institution investment, um, that has also increased awareness. I think Gen Z, uh, the talent, that is, I mean, when I talk to companies, that's the one thing everybody can get behind, <laughs> talent. Um, they're going to vote with their feet. Uh, Glassdoor now has a rating for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Companies are rated on it. And employees at current companies can comment on the culture, and that will show up at Glassdoor. So I think this increased awareness and increased transparency is um, what's going well now and will continue. Yeah. Hey, do we have the results from the poll? Let's, let's bring them in. Uh, very interesting. Risk of implicit biases. Uh, gets, you know, so there's, there's definitely going to be issues out there. And it, it's very interesting to see the priorities that the audience gives to those. Uh, we're, we're getting down to the very end here. Terry and Carl, I want to come back to you. You've actually written some books about this. Uh, can you tell her, do, do we have a screenshot of them? And can you tell us about what the books are about and what people can learn from them? Sure, and before we start sharing the screen, uh, we're about to issue the second book. Um, we've written two books with SAE, and the first one was The Road to the Top is Not on the Map, and that was really about some of the challenges and different ways that women have made successful pathways um, through organizations. And the reason for doing that one was, it, there many times women don't have mentors or people that are trying to, to forge a path like they are and to share those stories really helps. And then during COVID, we had been hearing from a number of sources about the stressful situations, how they managed it, how diversity has, has started to play a role in their companies and sustainability as well is another big topic that we haven't talked at all about, but it's key to companies' metrics these days. So those are the questions in the second book. Um, and some of them were in the first, some of them were not. And we got very frank and honest um, answers to the questions that we asked. Terry? Yeah, yeah we, we had the chance, um, John, Carla, and I had the chance to hear, we have 70 women that are profiled in the book that's coming out this month. and. Um, I heard some surprising themes um, and one of back to your earlier question about what's going well in the remote work environment. One of the themes is innovation is going well. And part of the reason for that is that there is a leveling effect from virtual technology. So it is much easier to include uh, to, to Ashwini's point, 
all that all that the store that powerhouse of information and talent from around the globe to easily convene that and bring that to bear on the challenges of the industry. So there's a lot of hope and inspiration um, and some concrete advice and examples from these executives in in the book. So I would encourage you to check it out. <laughs> well, what impressed me is you, you wrote this book. It was published by the SAE. It was such a bestseller. They came back and said, hey, write another book. So <laughs> I'm really impressed by that. But look, we're going to have to wrap this up right now. We've uh, used up our hour. I want to thank Ashwini, Cheryl, Terry, Carla. Thank you all for a very interesting conversation. Thank you, John. Thank Thanks, you, John. John. Thanks, John. Have a good and of day, course, everyone. we want to thank the audience for having watched all Absolutely. of this and participating in the polls. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Bye.